Hi guys! Today my plan is to talk about a couple of recent studies that have started to investigate whether the pandemic has fundamentally changed some of our intrinsic values that we have as, as humans and speculate a little bit about the longer term consequences for uh, societies around the world. Specifically I will uh, focus on these four different studies, three of them published, recently published, one of them, as far as I know, still unpublished as a preprint. And I'm going to draw a little bit on these diverse data sets, as I will show you in a second, with different approaches, but I think quite interesting converging evidence about potential uh, longer term effects of the pandemic. I will give you also a quick overview over the main theory of values that is used in psychology, provide a quick overview of some of the biological theories that can be used to explain how pandemics may influence human behavior, and potentially just speculate a little bit about uh, potential longer term consequences. So when we talk about values, the most common theory that we use in psychology is developed by Shalom Schwartz that argues values are beliefs that help us to make sense of the world, their evaluation criteria, they determine what is important for us, the kind of goals that we strive towards to. And so in my own work, I typically refer to values as motivational goals, the things that drive us, that we try to aspire to, that we um, use as a guide in our day-to-day uh, -day activities. And the important thing, values have a coherent structure. Um, typically, they're measured with something that looks potentially like this, where we ask people, you know, like, for example, equality, you know, having equal opportunity uh, for all in, in life is something that is important for me um, and how important it is. There are other ways of measuring values as well. Um, some of the more recent measures that I will also, uh, you know, like the studies have used, use somewhat more, um, you know, items that look a bit more like personality measures, where you see a short description of a person and you have to decide whether that person resembles you or not. But the interesting thing is, you know, like when once we ask people about a large number of values, we can start understanding what values are more or less important for an individual and understand the basic structure of values. And so the best way to represent these different motivational goals is in in kind of a two-dimensional circular structure. And the idea is that values that are motivationally compatible with each other are located close to each other and values that are, you know, motivationally uh, discrepant or, you know, like are in conflict with each other, they tend to be um, located at opposing ends in this kind of two-dimensional structure. So to just break this down a little bit, if we think, for example, um, about values that are called self-transcendence in Schwartz's theory, uh, so caring about social justice, equality in life, so, you know, like caring about other people in society and about nature or caring about uh, close family and friends like benevolence response you know being responsible um, helping others that are close to us so often in in the biological world this is associated with altruistic actions and these two values are obviously compatible with each other because they are focusing on motivation to transcend selfish interests and help others, either close people to you, uh, like family or friends, or distant people in society or um, overall. And on the other side of the circle, so obviously these values are um, compatible with each other. And on the other side of the circle, we have values related to um, enhancing your own interests. So either, you know, like by showing achievement according to social standards, you know, like so being ambitious, uh, trying to be influential, uh, looking for success or looking for power. So power is um, typically associated with, you know, like trying to gain uh, material wealth, gaining social influence, having control over others or control over resources. So basically egoistic values. And so again, achievement and power obviously are motivationally congruent with each other. But the important thing is that typically you can't simultaneously um, be, you know, like altruistic and also egoistic at the same time. 
right? So there is a conflict between these two values. And in specific situations, people have to make a decision whether they want to transcend their selfish interests or whether they want to actually um, achieve something that is at the expense of others but benefits them personally. Right, so we have this kind of uh, intrinsic conflict between these uh, two motivations. So this is a very classic dimension within biology, uh, this kind of selfish versus altruistic dimension. Um, within the sociological literature, there's also, you know, like another dimension, um, which is captured here in the... Uh, value circle by Schwartz. Uh, on one hand, you have values where, you know, like you pursue self-directed um, inclinations, you, you look for stimulation in your life, you are looking for a hedonistic pleasure, right? So this is openness to change. You look for new things, exciting things to do in your life. You're less dependent on your social uh, environment, on your social group. And on, and these values are conflicting with more conservative values, where you value or uh, what is important for you is, you know, like play, um, paying attention to your traditional um, norms in your family, in your local group, in your religious group, conforming to social rules, and also, you know, being concerned about the security for yourself, for your um for your family and friends, as well as the security of others, right? So as we can see, there are like two major dis um, motivational distinctions in this in this value theory, and we can organize values in terms of whether they are motivationally congruent or motivationally in conflict with each other. The interesting thing is that these uh, two major um, dimensions with these 10 different value types here in the circle can also be broken down further. So in 2012, Schwartz revised his theory and made finer distinctions. For example, self-direction. So pursuing uh, uh, new, exciting, interesting ideas could be broken down into, for example, self-directed thoughts, so a more kind of intellectual uh, way of expressing your um, independent ideas uh, and, and seeking um, interesting, open new uh, avenues, or expressing that through action, right? So, you know, expressing that uh, externally through behavior. Or you could, for example, distinguish um, power into um, a kind of attempt to dominate others or an attempt to capture resources, right? So we can make finer distinctions, but the interesting thing is that you, we can um, look at these value congruent and uh, conflicting motivations at various different levels of, of abstractness. So we can look at it at the four higher order values, at the 10 values, or we can break it even further down into 19 values. Or if we want, we could make even finer distinctions. The important point here is the, why I spend so much time on this is because I think it is quite important if we think about uh, what drives us in, in our day-to-day -day activities, obviously we need to make fine distinctions uh, at times. And so it is important to have a theoretical tool that allows us to make these kind of distinctions. And at the same time, uh, that also offers more um, fine-tuned insights when, for example, in the context of the pandemic, when something sudden happens, you know, like we might start to understand a little bit better how motivational actions or inclinations of individuals have changed. So the important thing is these values have been linked to pretty much every single behavior that you can imagine of. Um, values have been studied ex extensively in political, political science and sociology and social psychology, um, even in clinical psychology, and they have been shown to relate to most conscious behaviors that we as humans do, right? So values are important in our lives. They guide a lot of our voluntary actions. So now, what happens if suddenly we have this huge threat um, surrounding us. So all of a sudden, um, people are starting to die around us. There's this threat out there. How does that affect what is important to us? So now let's step one step back and think about in biology, what are the kind of conditions and environments that humans had to confront in our past? 
And this is really at the core of parasite stress theory, uh, a theory that has been uh, developed out of biology and evolutionary uh, theorizing that argues humans in our evolutionary history had to make trade-offs between exploring new environment that provide new resources, uh, but they could be risky, right? So you actually have um, a risk of being exploited, of potentially dying or uh, catching some debilitating disease. So you constantly have to make this trade off whether it's safe to actually go out, explore, or actually secure your basis and forego some potentially um, uh, rewarding activities or um, resources, right? So we have to make uh, these kind of trade-offs. And the important thing now is that parasites, the, the amount of parasites, the amount of diseases in an environment shift these strategies either towards an exploration um, and if it is safe to go out or shift them more towards a kind of um, uh, conservative kind of uh, inward focusing uh, tendency when there's more uh, disease threat out there. And this has been called the behavioral immune system. So Mark Schaller's work is really important here, um, differentiating between a reactive and a proactive component, reactive, basically uh, actively avoiding any kind of potentially contagious um, individuals or situations. So really um, trying to avoid situations that pose a potential inf infection risk. And the proactive component is, you know, like the establishment of uh, social norms, rules, belief systems that maintain the group safe. Uh, this can often also lead to so-called uh, or to superstitious cultural beliefs about all sorts of things uh, often related to uh, pre-scientific ideas about um, uh, what might make us sick, right? And both of them are cost contingent. So there's constantly this kind of uh, implicit, you know, like reward risk trade off going on in the backs of our mind. This kind of theorizing has been supported in a number of studies here. I, I just show you a couple of um, correlations at the, at the nation level based on previous research, for example, the ASH paradigm. Um, where basically people have to disconform to a majority to say that uh, two lines, uh, that you know, like one line is is different from the others, or variability in ratings in in surveys, large scale surveys that have been applied to um, large samples around the world. So, do people actually? express a greater variety of opinions or do they stick to a specific um, you know like middle response for example the extent to which parents think that obedience is an important childhood quality that they want to instill in their children and also for example the amount of uh, left-handed individuals around the world and what you can see is the more diseases and parasites you have in an environment the more likely that it is that people start to conform to a majority. You have less individual variability, you have less uh, percent left-handedness in a society, you have a higher number of people expressing, for example, obedience as an important um, childhood quality, right? So based on you know, like uh, observational research from around the world, there seems to be some kind of um, evidence for these dynamics. And also an interesting study from 2011, you know, sometimes it can be the mere, you know, like a, a, an occasional, you know, remembrance that diseases are out there. So in this study, um, people were interviewed and there was either a hand sanitizer present or not. And just the presence of the hand sanitizer seemed to shift responses towards a more kind of conservative social attitude, right? So sometimes it's just these kind of situational um stimuli that already can shift us, you know, at a very subtle level towards more conservative attitudes. So the question now really is what happens in a situation like COVID pandemic? All of a sudden, bang, there's this threat out there. Uh, people start um, to die. Hospitals are overwhelmed. There's this sense, you know, like of insecurity. How does that actually influence um us as humans and our values. So here I'm going to show you data from four different places, France, Brazil, Poland, and Australia. I just, you know, like the timeline, as you can see, they're very different curves. So these are absolute um, 
deaths at a particular point in time. We can also express it as, you know, like the relative risk. So you can see uh, France risk very early on was quite high. Brazil also relatively high. But other places like Australia, for example, didn't actually experience that much, much risk. So, you know, a very interesting question. What's happening in these different environments? So let's have a look. What was, how did these studies actually collect their data and when. So the Australian study is the most interesting in this respect because it is the largest. There were three data points prior to the pandemic, one um, data collection very early on when Australia first went into lockdown, and then a second data collection point in the second half of 2020 as people were already like living with this threat of potential infection for some time. As you, as you can see, Australia, the risk is actually relatively low, but still people were conscious of it and their daily activities were restricted by COVID. Then there is a study that was conducted in Poland. Uh, again, very interesting because they collected data nine, man, nine months prior to the pandemic. Then within the onset of the uh, restrictions and then two weeks later again. So the interesting thing here, similar to Australia, the actual risk of being infected in Poland was very low, but obviously there was a hard lockdown and you know the activities that people had were severely restricted. Then we have a study from France that was conducted at a time when the risk was actually relatively high in France of, of uh, contracting and, and potentially a risk of dying from COVID. Um, that study only measured individuals at a single time point, but it used two different um, ways of asking about values, which I will quickly discuss later on. So that's why I think it's quite interesting, also because of the context uh, with that high risk of infection. And finally, there's a study, also a single data point uh, from Brazil, where individuals were asked about their values at a point when um, there were large scale restrictions in the part where the study was uh, conducted and the risk of infection was increasing. So those four studies. And let's start with the biggest one, with the Australian study. Um, it was recently published in Social Psychology and Personality Science. It's a nearly representative sample. Um, as I said, three different data points, two during the pandemic. I will focus specifically on the smaller data set that was measured across all five data points. And the interesting thing about the specific study is that it used a forced choice uh, response format, so we can rule out all sorts of response biases that we normally worry about with value studies. So what I will show you here, I will break it down into the 10 values because I think there's a lot of information there that is actually worth looking into. So what I what I show you here is, you know, like a, a massaged kind of infographic uh, comparing basically the three time points prior with the changes in March and in September last year as the pandemic unfolded. So I'll, let's break this down. So let's look first at self-direction as we go around the circle. So what we can see compared to the three years prior, in September, self-direction actually increased. What we see in, in some other data is there, were, there was an initial decrease and then an increase again in these values that are more kind of uh, self-centered overall. So that's interesting. Keep that in mind. What we find, second of all, there was a significant decrease in stimulation value. So, you know, like the extent to which people went out um, and tried to stimulate stimulate their senses uh, were curiosity driven in, in their endeavors, right? So immediately there was an impact on that and the exploration behavior went down. And also there's a decrease in hedonism over all three data points here. In contrast, achievement and power value did not change in a significant way that we can detect in the sample. On the other hand, security value, so caring about the safety of others around you and, and safety in general, significantly went up specifically in the early parts of the pandemic. On the other hand, conformity and tradition values as such 
did not change, right? So there was an increase with security, but not so much with um, following your traditions and uh, following norms in your, in your social group overall. For benevolence, so caring about uh, and, and actively caring uh, and helping others close to you decreased over time. And the same happened with universalism, so caring about other people in society. It seems that Australians reported being less concerned about the well-being of others around them as the pandemic unfolded. So now let's look at Poland. So Poland, similar to Australia, uh, relatively low risk initially compared to other uh, contexts, uh, relatively strict lockdown, uh, relatively small study, so 150 participants that reported uh, um, a survey, the PVQ 57, so a very extensive survey, online three time points, uh, one before, one early on in the lockdown, and then um, two weeks later. So. Let's have a look. Break this down. Uh, it's a more extensive survey, so there are finer distinctions that we can make. So the first thing is, if we break down self-direction values into these intellectual and the behavioral components, what we can see here, somewhat similar to the Australian sample, we see some kind of increase in intellectual self-direction. So potentially people actively sought out information but did not necessarily express that in their behaviors. An interesting uh, observation, and I will come back to that later. Nothing happened for stimulation, but hedonism went down, right? So as people were in lockdown, hedonism, so the gratification of nice things that you like to do in your day-to-day -day activities, decreased. <clears throat> Achievement actually went up, so people started reporting uh, conforming more to social goals and, and, and trying to pursue social goals more. And I will come back to that later on, because that is an interesting observation in this data set. Nothing happened with uh, power values in specific uh, terms. For security, both concerns about your personal security as well as the security of your social environment significantly increased. So huge increase there, uh, very strong effect size overall. In Poland, we also saw an increase in conformity value. So people were more willing to follow rules uh, and express that rules are important for them. And also they were more concerned about interpersonal relationships um, and, and that people actually you know, follow interpersonal norms. Benevolence, interestingly, um, in this time window, you know, like two weeks in and then another two weeks after the, the, um, the first measurement during the pandemic, Benevolence actually increased initially over time. As you can see here, it actually went down a little bit. So there seems to be an, an, an immediate first increase in benevolence, you know, caring about, about others, which then seems to move a bit back down towards um, a more baseline level. And finally, universalism across the board here actually increased. So in those four weeks, during that uh, measurement uh, period in, in this Polish study, what we can see is an increase overall, right? So some similarities, some divergences between the Australian sample and the Polish sample. So now let's look at that French sample. As I said, France um, was going through a, a severe uh, increase in number of infections and uh, increase rate of deaths during that time. It's a large sample, over a thousand people, and people were asked to respond to the PVQ-21, so uh, a measure that has been used repeatedly in the European Social Survey across uh, representative samples in Europe, and they were asked to re report twice on their values. Once, they were given the standard instructions, uh, so what is important in your life, and then they were asked, what is important for you right now during the pandemic? So now let's break this down. So the first thing is self-direction. So the pursuit of independent uh, thoughts, ideas, behaviors went down. 
all of these differences here are significant. Um, so the important thing is the, the major shifts overall. Second of all, stimulation really went down. People were not really interested in pursuing uh, stimulating, curiosity-driven activities during that time. Hedonism also went down. People had less, um, you know, were less inclined to pursue uh, hedonistic, uh, pleasurable activities. Both achievement and power also went down. Uh, so that is somewhat different from the Polish study. And I will come back to that in a bit. And importantly, security values really increased. That was one of the major increases. Uh, so people were much more concerned about the safety of uh, their loved ones and um, others around them. Interestingly, also conformity, similar to the Polish sample, increased. So people were more concerned about social norms, rules, traditions, uh, conforming to social expectations. Tradition values do, did significantly change, but not actually uh, that much. And finally, uh, caring about, actually actively caring about others didn't change that much. So th there was a very minor change overall and the same with universalism. So as you can see already, the pattern in France is somewhat similar to the pattern that we saw in Australia. So what can we conclude across these three studies so far? The one consistent major increase is in security values. People suddenly prioritize the safety of their own uh, in-group, of their, their loved ones, and also the security of their social surroundings. At the same time, both hedonism and stimulation tends to go down. Right? So people are less likely to actually actively go out and pursue activities that are pleasurable, that are curiosity driven. And that is pretty much what parasite stress theory would predict. Uh, Self-direction had some very interesting patterns uh, across the different samples. So in some samples it actually increased. And one of the interesting ideas underlying this could be that as people were confined in their homes and they were less likely to pursue other ways of expressing that, they had to look for activities in their homes, look for information, um, pursue anything that, you know, like keeps them in a way sane, which actually may have increased this intellectual part of self-direction. Um, people kind of thinking about what could they do that keeps them uh, engaged? Uh, how do they get actually also uh, relevant information as they are being confined in their homes, right? So the major distinction really is this openness to change versus security. And it is overall in line with what biological theories would predict. We saw relatively little change along the achievement power versus universalism benevolence. Um, consistent change, I would say. We saw relatively little consistent change there. Now we'll come back to that in just a second. So, but the interesting thing now is um, when we talk about parasite stress, Right, so there is this kind of component of like being concerned, being uh, having this fear, this threat of something out there, and this can take actually different components. One is the concern about physically getting sick, so this um, biological threat, and on the other hand, is also you know any kind of you know consequences. Most most importantly, economic consequences. You're at home, you're not actually getting money in many cases, so people. Uh, are unemployed, they have to rely on social security. So there's this huge financial burden, right? So we have two different, you know, like threat systems here now in modern societies. And how do they actually play out? How do they influence potential uh, these value dynamics? And so, first of all, this is something that was partially addressed in the Australian study. So there were some questions about being concerned of being infected by the virus. And what happened is this concern about infection increased conservation values, so specifically security values. And if you were more concerned about uh, infection, it also decreased your openness values, right? So as the um, theories, the biological theories would predict, it really shifts this balance of either exploring 
or being, you know, like more group um, conformity oriented, right? So very nice, um, nicely aligned with these predictions from biology. Self-transcendence also shifted somewhat in a somewhat unexpected way. Um, again, I will come back to self-transcendence in a little bit. Um, now let me get to that final study, the Brazilian study. The Brazilian study is interesting in this respect, looking at these other studies, uh, for two major reasons, in my opinion. The first one um, is a relatively large study, and it measured personality traits, right? So whether people were emotionally stable or emotionally uh, volatile, so, you know, driven towards experiencing anxiety, depression on a more frequent basis. And it also distinguished uh, with very simple measures between COVID worries, so being, you know, like worried about being infected, and also the economic worries, you know, being worried about the economic downsides, uh, potentially a recession and how that may influence um, your livelihood. Right. So, and the interesting question in that Brazilian study was whether these worries play out differently depending on whether you were emotionally more stable or unstable in relation to values. And what we first of all find is values as such are particularly strongly related to security. Um, Oh, security values are particularly strongly related to worries about infection, but we also see some correlations with um, other values. And again, one thing that is quite interesting here, that uh, worries about infection seem to have a stronger relationship overall with uh, value orientations, which again seems to be aligned with this parasite stress theory overall. But then once we start looking into these interactions between the, personality or in the personalities of these individuals and these worries, what we start seeing is if, is if we look here, for example, at on the right hand side, security values and hedonism here, those individuals that are less emotionally stable, so in red here, tend to be more affected in or tend to uh, report different values the more they worry about being infected with COVID, right? So it, these worries seem to affect those individuals more that are more in emotionally unstable, are more anxious, are more concerned about um, the world in general, and those individuals seem to shift their values more. Security values, they move in the way that we would expect, so those individuals tend to worry more about their personal security and the security of others around them. For those individuals that are more emotionally um, volatile and more worried about the virus, they actually tend to become a little bit more hedonistic. They want to potentially get pleasures right now. So everything is kind of restricted now. So they start worrying really about you know, like having pleasure in their life and having um, interesting you know, nice experiences in their lives. On the other hand, for those individuals that are emotionally stable, the worries tend to have less of an effect on their value scores. The same thing happens um, when we look at economic worries for power values. So those individuals that are less emotionally stable and are worried about um, the economic um repercussions of the crisis, they start to express more egoistic, more kind of power-related values. So they, they are worried now about how can I actually, you know, like get more access to resources? How can I get control over other people? Um, and so it, it might potentially really shift individuals to become more the proverbial bastards uh, for their neighbors. And those individuals who are more emotionally stable, actually the effect is in the opposite direction. And finally, um, in somewhat similar to some of the effects from the Polish study, what we find is an interesting interaction for achievement values. So those individuals who are emotionally stable and more worried about uh, the biological threats so of being infected tend to increase their achievement values, right? So it's the individuals that are emotionally more stable 
they are concerned about what is what is going on in their environment and what we think what actually happened there is those individuals you know following um for for example all the behavioral guidelines on on how to protect yourself they actually increase their sense of of achievement they follow the social norms which is an important um aspect of um achievement values and so they increase their um their potential of actually acting on the situation so it's kind of an empowerment effect that we can see here and potentially this is what also happened in that polish sample so coming back here you know like what we find is um relatively consistent effects across the board uh, as predicted by the biological theories but the interesting thing now is if the biological theories are appropriate we should also see some changes in the direction of how people actually behave and this is something that was studied um, in the french study following some very early on um, some very some paper um, published in the british journal of um, social psychology focused on the importance of shared human values for containing uh, the COVID pandemic and the idea was that if the sense of threat is increased which then leads to increased conservatism conservatism values it should lead to increased compliance and increased social distancing and this is partially what the uh, French study showed that actually the threat activated conservatism values which then led to an increase in these protective behavioral actions right so it seems to be adaptive so again a core aspect of these biological theories um, parasite stress theories of human behavior so overall really nice um very nice pattern unfortunately not nice from a human perspective but um, nice in terms of the theory so we see some congruent changes across a number of samples that are aligned with what we would expect based on biological theories. But we also can see some very interesting patterns that, that we need to consider in future studies. Um, one example here is the self-direction pattern, which seems to have uh, potentially these kind of drives, motivations to find information during a lockdown situation which go against which which is interesting i think um because they show that humans can direct their intention or and direct their motivation in interesting ways that go a little bit away from you know like classic biological theories you know showing the complexity of human behaviors second of all some of the patterns related to power seem to suggest that power and achievement um, seem to suggest that sometimes following the behaviors, the behavioral guidelines that are um, given by health authorities can actually increase the empowerment of individuals and, and reinforce some of the values. The interesting thing is that, that these self-enhancement values are not necessarily the values that we would normally want you know, society to endorse because they are often highly competitive, highly egoistic, and over a longer period of time undermine the social good within a society. So, you know, like in a way, the pandemic, even though it has a short term positive effect, if these values become um, established over term, over longer periods of term, uh, over longer periods of time, that may actually create some, you know, like not so desirable effects from a uh, social perspective. And finally, the Australian data suggested that universalism and benevolence, so caring about others, actually decrease. So the, the Australian study is interesting because, as we have seen, it is the context where we had the least number of infections, so the lowest risk overall. Um, but also we have the, the the largest sample over the longest period of time during the pandemic, right? And so what this suggests is that there are potentially longer term effects of the pandemic, even in relatively benign environments, right? So, and as we move forward, you know, like the data that I presented to you was collected last year, but a lot of the peaks in the infection and mortality rates only start to happen after the end 
of the data collection. So, and as we are right now confronting uh, new variants that are more infectious, uh, that have a huge potential to create yet another wave uh, in the in the fall. Uh, I'm just wondering what could be the longer term effect of these um, infection rates, potentially new lockdowns in a couple of months time on the values, because now we start to talk about two years. Two years is already a, a quite a significant amount of time, and especially for younger people, this can really change their motivation, their, their outlook in life, and can create some longer lasting changes in motivational outlooks, in value orientation of the larger population. So the question really is uh, longer term effects. So we see some rebound effects, for example, for self-direction values in Australia, but we also see this reduced concern for others, both in Australia and in Brazil. And this is something that actually worries me because that can potentially have longer term consequences for society overall. And the important issue that we have to look into, and that's why we need more studies, is this continuing effect of threat. Um, because it's not just, you know, like a one-off little threat that little threat that uh, people are confronting, but in terms in the the effects of COVID now are impacting on the livelihood of people over a much longer time. A lot of people lost family members, lost friends, so their grief process is going on. So there are much more uh, complicated social uh, dynamics going on, which now are likely to increase uh, effects on values. So these are some kind of thoughts, you know, like digesting the patterns from these four different studies. If there are other studies out there, please let me know. Um, leave some comments in, uh, in the comments below. Send me some messages and I really look forward to hearing from you, I, discussing ideas and also collaborating uh, on future studies. There's some really great studies in the pipelines. Um, so for example, the group uh, led by Chris Welzel, they have organized a big project. So there's interesting study com studies coming out and it would be great to actually focus more on these effects and think through and also think about how we need to make changes in our social environment in order to decrease the potential negative effects of this pandemic in areas like social values and the way we interact with each other. Thanks a lot and um, keep up the good work.